Well, well, folks, uh, you know you're in for a treat when you hear that tune because it's time for another episode of the Rec Poker Podcast. Uh, I am uh, Chris Jones. This is your chats edition. I'm filling in for Jim Reed, who is finally, I think, going to be back home from his big trip to Ireland. I hope we can catch up with him a little bit about that um, ne next week, because I, I think that, was, that sounded like a, a blast that people had over there. And I, I was very jealous hearing all the updates as we did. But um, this week we have we are recording. We have an, an a a interview with Chris Reed. Uh, so we'll be talking to Chris shortly. Um, but before we do, uh, I want to remind everyone that uh, it takes more than just your host to produce everything we do at Rec Poker. Rec Poker is mostly a volunteer based organization, uh, but uh, we do what we do because you're able to sometimes. Um, Contribute to us as premium members. We also have a sponsor, our Running Aces Hotel, Racetrack, and Casino. And then we have the illustrious Wrecking Crew who help make the magic happen at Wreck Poker. So uh, I would invite our Wrecking Crew to introduce themselves. S usually starts with me. So starting with whoever's first in order, John. Joe. <laughs> Joe. <laughs> I'll go. <laughs> My name is Joe Coolis. Um, you can find me at Joe Cool PhD on Blue Sky as well as Twitter. Um, and I'm LV to 11 in the home game. And my responsibility uh, is to run the PsyOps uh, workshops uh, on the third Thursday of every month, where we delve into the psychological concepts that drive your poker game and sometimes push you in directions that you didn't realize. And I'm John Somsky, also known as Poker Geek MN Everywhere. And it's an interesting fact that Joe, in fact, alphabetically comes before John, but Joseph comes alphabetically after John. Hence, Chris's confusion. See? See? Yeah. I Thank you. Saying. Thank you. Anyway, Thank you. I help organize our home games. <laughs> it's a psyops to keep everybody on their toes. <laughs> And now it would be I'm someone Keith who Brent. is muted. Yeah. I'm Keith Brent. That's Monkey System Online. And it definitely after the alphabet of both of these fine gentlemen. And I uh, run the Monkeys Off Table Tools segment every month. Uh, and uh, in Monkeys Off Table Tools, we, we use various study tools like uh, GTO Wizard, uh, and et cetera, basically advanced poker training to um, study poker and have some fun uh, smashing computer bots. And I'm Rob Washam, and I'm Rabman50 just about everywhere. And I host a book study on the first and third Wednesdays of every month. And one of the people who's not here, because uh, she uh, was over in Ireland as well, is Kim Kilroy. Uh, she uh, runs our hand, uh, hand history review, but she also runs uh, some uh, an occasional uh, poker empowerment group where she uh, is find, finding some of the kind of maybe some of the lesser known and some of the more well-known uh, women in poker and doing interviews with them and talking strategy with them. And um, one of those um, episodes was with Chris Reed and that's what we're going to be uh, playing for you in just a moment. So that'll be the interview that you'll be hearing and then we'll return and we'll go over some home game results and talk about um, some things coming up at Running Aces. So, but tune in for the interview right now. All right. Uh, welcome everyone to our Poker Empowerment Week meeting for the month of May. It is May, right? Oh, my God. Yes, it's I get May. confused with all the traveling and everything else. So I'd like to welcome my friend, good friend, Chris Reed. Um, I was really excited. I've been trying to get her on here for months and months, but she's finally here. Um, I'm really excited for her to join us because she's a recreational poker player turned pro, something that some of us in this rec poker group aspire to. So um, I'm going to just try and remember some of the stuff you told me Chris because I didn't I had it all up here before and now I'm uh now I don't have it up here but uh Chris when did you turn pro How long ago? oh at the worst possible time um just right before, before COVID, COVID. <laughs> yeah so I was doing really well and it was like six months in 
and had great momentum. And uh, then COVID hit and I had to sit at home and play online, which I truly hate. Um, I really, You're really like, like I like to play live. I want to look at the person I'm playing with. And uh, I just do so much better live. But uh, so I had like the six month, seven month hiatus and uh, used that time to learn mixed games online because I couldn't go in person. So, you know, so did a lot of Fun. studying. Fun. Okay. So I think you said your background was in finance and banking. And then when did you uh, get sort of the bug for poker? Like, tell us about your journey. How did you start? Um, well, I met this guy named Rick Reed, R-E-A-D. And uh, I met him at a sports bar kind of place. And, and then I found out that he was up there playing poker four or five nights a week, just bar poker. And uh, he took me with him. I had not played poker since playing stud uh, at my grandpa's bar. And when I was a senior in high school, I bartended at 17 in Louisiana in my uncle's bar. And I would go in the back with those guys and play poker and bure and play just a hand or two enough, you know, win a big pot and leave because I was 17. They didn't care. Um, but I hadn't played poker in many years. And... Uh, I sat down to play and there was like 95 people playing and I was the first person out. He had printed out the little thing with what beats what and put it on the back. Of, I had shrunk it down and put it on the back of my phone. <laughs> and real time I, assistance. I was livid. I was just like, oh my God, I'm the first person out. And I'm so competitive always in life and everything. And so um, that whole next week I read books. I watched it on TV. That's when it was when was that 2006 um so I think we met in five so 2005 and so I was watching on tv every night and anyway I went back the next week I went back with him and I got 12 out of 90 something people and just got bit by the bug and just did it here and there um just bar poker for years and then I got where I couldn't stand bar poker and I started playing in casinos, got my ass handed to me over and over and over, but uh, finally figured it out. And now my poor husband tells people it's probably the worst thing he ever did was bringing me to poker because <laughs> he plays poker once a month, maybe. And um, he doesn't have the patience for the long tournaments that I love. So I leave him seven to 10 days a month and he hates it. So, but oh, well, he supports me. He loves me that's good oh that's good and you are you love to travel and play like I do I know right and you just recently I think won the ladies tournament in Malta I did I did yeah no yeah, yeah so that congratulations was congratulations on that it was quite the um the trip I played four events I bagged the main punted the main on day two horrible played one hand so bad um jumped took an hour to get my shit together and jumped in the ladies won it and then the next day played the high roller stone cold bubbled got it two outed and stone cold bubble cried like a baby had a major meltdown and then made myself go play the last event after I drug myself out of bed at 4 p.m so depressed made myself play it and got fourth out of 274 Excellent. It's just a bipolar trip. So I think yeah. that was the Hendon Mob Championship, right? We played no, one of those was, recently. No, it was it? just called, it was just, there was the Hendon Mob Championship, but I was playing the high roller that day. The high roller, um, yeah. So it was just called the last chance. And the it was a $120 buy-in, but it wound up being 7,000 for first place. That's wow. a pretty good return. That's yeah. a pretty good return. You um, played in your first main event last year. And yeah, I think I, you were one of Norman Chad's sleeper picks as well, from what I remember. Yeah, I kind of about that experience. I muscled my way into that. I got like everybody I know to send him a tweet. And he literally was like, oh, you muscled your way into this. You got this, you know. But then it, it worked out very well. He was very sweet. 
and he came and talked to me every day and checked on my progress and saw like, you know, when I was super low and then grinding back up every day. Um, it, it was good. I had won a $600 satellite at Harris, New Orleans a year and a half earlier, literally Mardi Gras weekend, which is the end of February, right when COVID exploded. And so um, I won the 10K seat and just held it until we could have it. But uh, yeah, so my last hand, not my last hand, the bad hand. Um, I had Jason Kuhn in the one seat. I'm in the two seat. Jason's under the gun. He raises. I look down at pocket aces. I bay a huge three bet, but I've been playing with Jason all day. He's so amazing. And I was, it made me elevate my game because I was not about to let Jason Kuhn see me screw up. So we were playing really well, both of us all day. And I made a huge three bet to say, get out of my pot. And he told me he was, he told me later he was going to fold to my three bet. He had ace king, um, but he knew I had something much better. It got around to the end of the table and this older gentleman from Louisiana, where I'm from, um, four bet shove, 64 big blinds with pocket sevens. You know the rest of the story. So um, so I, uh, he hit a seven in the window. I got crippled. He said it was his favorite hand. That's why he did it. Jason did fold before I snap called and uh, it crippled me. And it was just a little bit before hand for hand. And uh, so it was on day three or four then, right before the money. Deep in day three. And I ended up um, going totally card dead for the next three hours. Totally card dead from that moment on. And every hand was three and four bet, you know, with the people that were my table. But anyway, um, I had six more hands before I had to put my last chip in when they were doing the hand for hand, it took an hour and 45 minutes to get five from a thousand and five to a thousand. It was crazy. And uh, so I was like, I have six more hands until this last chip goes in. And aces got cracked by ace nine, everybody cheered. And I put one chip in a bag and cashed for 15,000. <laughs> I was, was great not, story. I was not <laughs> about to not cash. So it was yeah. fun. Wow. Was fun, but, I, but I think I well, congrats. Five that's that's congrats on that. We have one of our own playing his first main event this year. Yay. He won a satellite series that we ran. And so I'm sure he'll be looking for some tips later from you. Oh, yeah, for, I'm soaking him up for prep. Yeah. prep the work hardest, for the, it's the hardest tournament say, I've ever played. I think Dara O'Carney would be very proud of you, Chris. Very, very proud of you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, for yeah. sure. And um, hardest, but the, also it's the best tournament. Like the structure, the two hours levels, like it's just the best tournament. Yeah, it, it was definitely very fun. Just getting low and having to come back. And I only, I only sucked out one time and it was against Barry Greenstein. I had played with him in two other events. And so he was opening light, opening light, opening light. And I looked down at my favorite non-premium hand, if I had one, 910 suited. And um, I was low and I, sh I three bet shoved. He snap called with his ace king. I was like, oh, great. And I, I rolled over my cards and he's just like, and I hit the 10 in the window. He bricked and he leans over to me and he says, I haven't seen you get out of line like that yet. And I, cause we played together for a couple of, and I'm like, I, I haven't. <laughs> that was my first suck out. So, um, but it was good. Barry was very nice about it. So, yeah, good. Just a little underhanded comment there. Just one. So. <laughs> but, you know, but, but he had a lot of chips and I had a little yeah. bit. So it didn't really right. hurt him. Didn't hurt him. All right. So let's talk about women in poker. It's a really hot topic right now. Hot, hot, hot. It's all over social media. Um, you are a big advocate with uh, for women in poker. You're always promoting women. You're always you run the Facebook group called Poker Queens, and you're always posting about everybody's uh, successes on there, whether they're little successes or big successes. Um, you do a lot of work, I know, for the uh, WPA. We've had uh, Ruth on here. We've had Lupe on here. So um, we. 
we know a little bit about that. Um, you do some live reporting, I think, for the WPA. Um, yeah, I get to interview so, great people. So I love it. We're, we're really trying to, like everybody right now, encourage more women to get out and play live poker. Yeah. Do you have any advice there? On We have a big crowd of men here. Like, let's have some advice on how to get more women out there. You know, it's, it's such a big issue and it's got so many facets to it. You know, for, for younger women, uh, I never could have played poker before my kids were bigger. When I met my husband, I'd gotten divorced. Um, my kids were teenagers. And so it was a little bit easier for me to get into it. So, I mean, there's so many different reasons that women don't get into poker. And, and I think like reading Daniel Negrano's tweet a few days ago, mm -hmm. you know, I think he missed the mark on what he was trying to say. I think he, I don't think he understood because he kind of melded, you know, why women don't play with what makes them stop playing, um, the women who do play, you know? So they're two different things. So, you know, why women don't play, there are tons of reasons, responsibilities, money, children. Um, a lot of women get in much later. And then, you know, you look at like the women who are the big ambassadors for the big groups, um, the, the paid ambassadors, you know, it's, it's almost impossible for a woman, no matter how good she is, to get that if she's over 40. If you notice, you know, these, that's just what it is. But um, once we get the girls, get the ladies to learn about poker and to, to love poker, then the other part comes in with, how do we keep them playing poker when they sit down and someone is a total jerk to them? I've been called so many names at the poker table. I had a man with my husband there um, tell me that he was going to go to his car and get a gun at the poker table in Georgia. Um, this is probably about 10 years ago <laughs> because I beat him in a big hand. You know, there's so many women that when something like that happens, they're not coming back to play poker. You know, they're just, they're not going to play poker anymore. So I think there's a reason that the women that you see doing well in poker are mostly business owners, corporate executives, um, women with really thick skin. And even with having thick skin, if, if, <laughs> if you had read my poker blog today on Facebook, you would be thinking something totally different because of the meltdown that I had in Malta. So um, it, it, it just, I, I think we just got to keep doing what we're doing as far as encouraging women, having free roles, doing the, you know, the, the online and the live um, poker training. I've done free seminars in Atlanta where we had 26, 28 women come and you know, the poker power, WPA, Plon, all of those things are great. But I, I think a whole lot of it is once we get the women is really enforcing the rules at the table as far as being men being abusive to women, because that's a big, big part of it. Right. But, I, you know, but I don't think there's any secret to it. I think we how do you handle it when you have um some sort when you're accosted either verbally or in any other way like I'm not very nice um I I, I <laughs> um I was raised on a little bitty farm in Louisiana um I was super poor always had to work so hard and feel like you know I have the right to be here I'm a feminist uh, so when someone is nasty to me, I'm right back nasty to them, good or bad. I felt really guilty about that before in my life. And I felt like, okay, sometimes maybe that's not <laughs> what a poker advocate female should do. Um, but sometimes I just can't help it, you know? So it's natural to you to yes. respond like that, right? It, exactly. I wish I could be the person who takes the higher road sometimes, but usually I give it right back.
Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, I'm fascinated by your uh, transition from recreational to pro. And what did you do uh, to sort of prep yourself for that? Did you just say one day I'm going to be pro or did you have a bankroll you started with? Did you do some ex? Did you get some coaching? Did you, uh, are you a GTO studier? Like what? Basically all of the above. I started playing like one or two weekends a month, um, playing a whole lot more like WPT, WSOP, um, you know, smaller events, 300, $400 buy-ins and um, started playing multi-day tournaments and just preparing myself for, okay, if I want to do this, I know that I'm going to have to play longer tournaments. I'm going to have to be grinding. I'm going to have to be mentally and physically prepared. Um, and I started saving the money that I made from poker and, you know, got a bankroll together. And um, more than anything, I had major surgery and ruptured some disc in my neck and was having a really hard time um, driving all the time, being a um, sales executive for a big bank. I was on the road a lot. And uh, finally, my husband and I discussed it and finally just said, you know, I think this is the time I've studied, I've studied, I've done, I've done. Um, I think I can do this. And I think this is a time to try and do it. So, um, and of course studied even more and still study every single day, you know, after deciding, pulling the trigger. Now I make a lot less money now, I'll be honest. You know, <laughs> this is my, with COVID, this is like two and a half years in now with, with COVID. And uh, I had a great last quarter of last year, propelled me really well. Uh, the, this year has started out very slow. So, but, uh, you know, the year's not over. Are you planning to do a full WSOP schedule or just certain parts of it? Yeah, I'm planning to go out for three weeks and play the ladies world championship, the mini main and the main. And I think I have been really, um, blessed with, while this big learning curve, and it is a big learning curve, um, grinding on the circuit with these guys and, you know, just seeing, because you, you play with people who are shooting 10 and 12 bullets into almost every event. And they're winning a lot of events. They're final tabling a lot of events. Um, but I know, you know, they're staked a lot. And I know that, you know, they can't be making that much after shooting all of those bullets. I try to shoot one or two bullets. Um, it, it makes my play have to be a little tighter, a little more solid, um, but there's a big learning curve. I've been lucky that I've had friends who want to invest in me. And even like, even though I won my way into the 10K, um, I still sold 40% of my action because mm -hmm. it's such, you know, variance. and aces mm -hmm. versus sevens and you, you know you just don't know so um and it always seems to be and it's fine that if i'm state for something that's when i do something good and if i'm not that's when you know but i'm the type do you think that you subconsciously play differently when you're state no i really do not um because even even when i'm not the people who like you know stake me for things if in that same series I decide to play something different or play something else uh, and then I cash good I still give them money most people don't but I still do because I'm like you know you have faith in me so if I do something I'm gonna I'm just gonna do it so right. but um it, yeah it's 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 very challenging it's the hardest thing I've ever done and I mean, by far. What are your main study tools? Like, what do you mainly? I watch do? a ton of poker that's been played. I watch a ton of live. I watch a ton of that. I have um, pokercoaching.com. I do the, you know, all of the, the quizzes. I watch all the videos. I do red chip poker. Um, I've studied all the charts. I know all the GTO 
Um, you know, I know what I'm like supposed to be playing in each position, you know, those type things. Um, and I really study the players and how they're playing, you know, the psychology of it. I mean, I sit and play very few hands the first couple hours of most tournaments so that I can figure everybody out. Yeah, that's good. It sounds like you're a nice blend of uh, using your feel for the game and your reads on people and also um, sort of a solid base of, of poker knowledge. Do you, um, um, do you, would you say you do have anybody you do hand histories with, or do you go over hand histories uh, like with, with friends or with coaches or with groups of people? Yeah, I've had a couple different coaches through the years. Um, I've done hand histories with tons of people, um, people that I played with in Atlanta, people that I played with on the road. Um, one of the, I don't want to make his head any bigger than it already is, but one of the guys <laughs> that um, just won a bracelet, his first bracelet this this uh, past fall, um, he I stayed up one night, I cornered him at like one o'clock in the morning after we both busted a poker tournament that we played together at the same table and picked his brain till 5 a.m. Um, and got lots of knowledge. Like he told me things that like I, that him and his buddies do at the table that I wanted to know what are they doing and why are they doing it and how do I beat it? And uh, being a salesperson, um, I was able to roundaboutly find out that information. So, um, because I, I've, asked, I've asked other guys who play with us here in the Southeast who are really good. And I've tried to ask them. And every time I've asked, I get one particular gentleman last time, he said, you know enough already, I'm not telling you anything and walked away. <laughs> so, um, so it's good when you can try to, when you can trick them into tell you, but you know, because because you know guys have that they do tons of that they do tons of the hand histories they do tons of sharing with each other this particular group works as a team a lot of times so they share their wins and losses so of course they're going to share with each other you know anytime you have a stable but uh it's it's a lot harder as a woman to try to break into that you play also play cash i do I played cash so, mini before tournament. Do you f find it easy to transition to one to the other, or do you prefer to play one at a, like just cash, or will you go and play cash after you bust a tournament, or do you because it's a different it's mindset, right? It's totally a, different. So when I decided to turn tournament pro, I did not play cash for a solid year, whole year, because in my mind. I needed to firmly cement tournament before I started playing cash again. And I, I want, cause they are such a different game. And I, you know, I had played tournaments and I had played cash, but, but I wanted to keep them in my brain totally separate. So I didn't play one hand of cash for a solid year. And I only started playing cash again about a year ago. So that's what I did. But um, I played cash and love cash for, you know, other than like bar poker here and there. But, but cash was the first thing that I really dominated at. And uh, but, yeah, they're so totally different. OK, and, so and something that people don't realize and it may, maybe a lot of people do, but I think they don't from watching is you have to play tighter at cash than you do tournament a lot tighter and. A lot of I people. tell people that all the time in my groups that when you're deep stacked, you got to play a lot tighter than when you get shorter in the tournament and then you can start mm -hmm. opening up your range. So, yep. you know, it's, I played uh, much, just, just like in a tournament at the beginning of the tournament, you want to play super tight. So many of these people play super loose because they have a bigger they have stack. lots of chips, <laughs> but it's the opposite, super tight, loosen up in the middle, tighten up at the end, you know? Yeah. So. yeah. I think All right. for me, that's what works for me. I am going to see if anybody he, uh, that's with us here has any questions for you, Chris. Okay. Jim. 
Yeah, I've got, um, I'm always interested in how people play cash and tournaments differently. Um, so mm -hmm. just as a, as that great segue, I'm, I'm not going to turn that down. So um, playing tighter, that's one example. And uh, can you just talk a little bit more about how you might play certain kinds of hands differently or the, the different stack depths or something like that, some other factors that you might uh, play differently? In cat, so do you want to know about cash or tournament? Like the difference between them, how, how you might do one differently in one versus the other. Yeah, I think for me, um, so things that are the same, position, 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 position in both is wonderful. Um, in, in cash, I am much more, I play much more tight, but when I have the hand, I play much, much, much more aggressive to take that pot down and take that money right there versus being much more trappy and knowing the percentages and the math on tournament where, you know, I want them to call behind in tournament. I want them to get, you know, even though you might wind up with a bad suck out, but you know that it's coming if it comes. Um, in cash, I want to take that pot down right then and there. And so I put maximum pressure in cash, you know, money wise. Um, so that's one thing that's that's different for me between cash and tournament. And I know some people play the opposite, but that's, that's what I do. Um, it's pretty easy to pick, to figure out like who the weak players are at the table in, you know, in either one. Um, it is interesting because sometimes I feel bad if I take some person's money <laughs> in cash, whereas in tournament, it's just the opposite. You know, it's just, I, I don't feel bad at all. I, I want to accumulate those chips to get to the end of that tournament versus cash. I, I'm thinking, was this, this guy's rent money, you know, that maybe he's super young or he's super old, you know, and I, and I feel kind of bad about it, but um I don't know. I mean, maybe if you have specific questions about cash versus tournament. No, no, that's exactly it. Sort of like, because I think people, people don't understand how different pressure can be applied in those kind of circumstances. And I think in, it's interesting in tournament, there's this emphasis on not losing your bottom chip. Um, so there's sort of like a, a different kind of pressure, but in cash, when stacks are so deep, um, I just feel like, yeah, it, it's an interesting tension that I like to kind of explore. Yeah, because if you, you know, if I get it in a head and I, and I, you know, shove for his whole stack, yeah, you know, he might suck out on me. I'll just rebuy. I mean, it's just, it's, it's just a different mentality altogether. And, and when I'm not playing well at cash, that's what I'm thinking, you know, I could always pull back out, but, you know, I think that, that there comes the discipline, that comes the discipline in poker, because I find now. I'm so much more disciplined at tournament than cash sometimes. So I have to straighten myself out every now and then. Would you like to see more um, women's events tournament, tournament wise? I mean, there are some, I, I've been talking to the WSOP stops I've gone to and the ones that haven't had a women's event are gonna start having one at their next, uh, at their next fun, at their next series so yeah. it's definitely taking off where they're oh, yeah. trying so i heard in malta that there was a higher percentage of women than there usually is in a tournament series i think there was and i think that was for a couple reasons i think that we did a pretty good job of promoting the ladies, um, Yvonne did a good job. Maureen did a good job. I did a good job. Susan did, you know, a lot of us did a really good job of trying to get more. Um, and also the fact that it was in Malta and it's just such a beautiful place. And a lot of people came for holiday. Um, I think that helped a little bit too. We had a, a I mean, a ton of ladies from London. Um, I had played with a couple before but there were several that I knew through the poker groups, but had never played with and got the opportunity to play with them um, in the ladies event. And uh, it was very interesting, the different styles of play, you know, based on geography. So 
I've also heard that many times before I played with Canadian ladies. Uh, I've heard from many ladies that, oh, the, you know, <laughs> the Canadians are they're very aggressive. The Canadian ladies, they like to bluff. They're very aggressive, you know. So um, it, it's just fun playing with ladies from different parts of the world and seeing how they play. You're, as, as everybody here, I'm sure knows, Kim is an amazing player. I played with her many times. <laughs> Thank you. Um, who has their hand raised? Somebody had it raised. Oh, Joe, me. go ahead, Joe. Joe. So, uh, you know, I really wanted to just echo a point that you made. It's a long time ago, back when you were talking about, um, you know, why women aren't playing. Uh, and one of my jobs is, is I chair a threat assessment team at the hospital that I work with. And I think that men and women, and particularly in the poker world, because I've been shocked at when I have conversations about why women don't play is that the men don't understand that, yes, you can be threatened <clears throat> when someone says they're going to get a gun, bring it up and shoot you for winning a hand. But all of us can be threatened in that way. Of course. But if a guy says, I'm going to grind up on you, the men in the room miss the fact that we see it as a sexual issue and the women see it as a threat. Because if somebody says that to me, I'm not worried that I'm going to get killed in the parking lot or uh, sexually assaulted. And until men, you know, not, not that I don't think women have a role, but until men are willing to take that understanding in terms of what goes on at the poker table, it's going to be really hard to change because they're not seeing the problems that you're facing because you have to be scared every single time you play. Does oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I have a pepper spray gun that I... Anytime that I'm playing anywhere, you know, I have it in my backpack and I have it cocked it in my hand all the time because you just, I mean, I've had, I've had, <laughs> I've had some crazy things happen. I've had some men say really crazy stuff to me, um, both ways, you know, um, that really worried me, like really, really worried me, you know, big giant guy tell me, come up to me when everybody's on break and I'm running to the restroom. And I notice that I see this guy like around a lot in Cherokee, North Carolina, big, big guy, burly lumberjack kind of guy, you know, and when, when, when a big guy comes up to you and tells you that you're the reason he comes to play poker there, it's very concerning for a little tiny girl. <laughs> I mean, it's just very, um, you can be put off by lots of things. There's lots of things that are said and done that, that I just don't think guys think about it. Like you said, I just don't think that they realize some of the things that they say, how uncomfortable it makes us at the table. But, but again, they don't realize it. They have, fix, you know? Yeah. Yeah. They, do, they don't realize it because they have male privilege and they don't understand it. It's something that we've, well, since we when were, they start talking yeah, about young the girls, trip, yeah, right. they start talking about the waitress walking by and they're talking very graphically, you know, and you're sitting at the table. <clears throat> Sometimes that's that can be very uncomfortable also. I mean, it's just there's so many things that that go into it that could be better. But, you, you know, times are changing slowly, but surely um, we're going forward for quite a while. Um, I live in the U.S., so, that, you know, there's lots of stuff always going on here. Um, a lot of men still won't admit there's an issue, as you were saying. You know, they just won't admit there's an issue. So, of course, they don't have to work on it because it's my problem, not their problem. Um, but it, it, I don't know. I, I've always just thought I, it's just something you have to deal with. And I, I know there's lots of effort being put into it. And I know it's better. I mean, my mother-in-law says I, back in the sixties, when she used to go to the country club, that women weren't allowed in the poker room. They had a slot machine out front and that's what they were allowed to do. So, you know, now I'd like to see someone tell me I can't come in the poker room because I'm a girl, you know, it, it, it would not be good, but right. so it, things are getting better. They are getting better. We are, and, and the more aware we make people and the more of this stuff is coming out on social media, the better it gets. Harold, you had can a I question? Just, yeah. Can I just finish one thing oh, up? Because I wanted to. Sure. So what would be better in terms, would you prefer it that men step in in the moment 
would you prefer men stay silent or would you prefer men get the floor when those things are happening, when people are talking about the waitress, when they're hassling you or harassing you? What, what would you, well, what, as, a, you, as a player? So I was in Choctaw, Oklahoma, <clears throat> and this guy got, got into it with another guy. And a few minutes later, I don't even remember what started it, but it was something in a hand. And he was just irate already. And something happened and he got really nasty with me. And I looked around the table to see, you know, like, is somebody going to say something? This guy's being really, really threatening, nasty, freaking me out. And, you know, no one said anything. When the dealer finally called the floor at my request and the floor came over and the dealer did not portray it very well and it, he you know said whatever and stop and left and we went on break like 10 minutes later when we went on break the gentleman to my right told me I'm going to talk to the floor and tell him what really happened well it would have been nice if he did that when the floor came originally but I understand that the guy who was being very um I don't know what the word is to me, arrogant, very um, threatening, what, whatever the word is. He was a big guy. He was a really big guy with tattoos all over. And I assume that he intimidated, that was what he was doing. He's intimidating me. I assume that he intimidated that guy too. So I didn't, I, you know, I, I, I cut him some slack and I didn't feel so bad, you know, about him for not stepping up and standing up for me at the moment but at least he did on break. And that made me feel better. That doesn't happen a lot. Most of the time men are just silent and we just deal with whatever we deal with and no one says anything. So I don't know if it's because they're uncomfortable. I mean, you guys are guys. Why, why would you let somebody be abused and not say anything, a man or a woman? I mean, I, I don't, but sometimes I wonder if women, particularly women who've played for a while, prefer to kind of manage things on their own. But I, you know, the truth of the matter is, is when I really think about it, I'm like, you know, I just need to speak, speak up and, and uh, not let it happen. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't mind if they let me manage it on my own, but then if the floor comes, I think that's the time to speak up okay. versus, you know, um, I mean, I know I've played at a table with my husband and no one knew my husband was at the table and someone's been really ugly, you know, and he hasn't said anything because to your point, he's like, I know you can take care of yourself. I don't want to step on your toes, you know, but I think if the floor gets called for anything like that, that's when you guys should probably say something. That's very helpful. Thank you. Harold? Yeah, thanks for your comments about the challenges um, that you face. I was playing at a local casino last week, and uh, at one time I looked around the table, and six of the ten players there were were women. But uh, actually, when I think about it now, I think the youngest one was probably in their forties, and uh, they were fifties plus. So it's it's interesting knowing your perspective on the, the challenges. I was just wondering about uh, you know. Do you play any mixed games? Do you have any interest in mixed games? What do you play? I do. And I wanted to make one more point to, to what you were saying. Even though I'm in my 50s, you know, even my husband gets harassed because I travel for poker. You know, his friends, acquaintances, they give him trouble, you know, <laughs> You know, times when we have like got into it about poker, he's he's like, you know, this person or that person thinks I'm crazy for letting you travel without me. You know, and it's 95% men, 5% women. I can see that perspective some. Um, his reply to them is usually, have you met my wife? I, you know, don't let her. She just does. And, you know, it is what it is. But um you know, I think that's the other part, too, that a lot of people miss, and we don't talk about it enough, is my husband depends on me more than I depend on him. And I don't know if you guys are married and you would agree with that, but I come home after being gone for five or six days, and there are five pizza boxes. He can't cook. 
you know, he's, he's, you know, after three days, he's calling me depressed, depressed. And so when are you coming home? I'm lonely, you know? And so, and I think it goes that way with most of the girls who are traveling versus the guys, because the guys are gone and the wives are just fine at home and they're very self-sufficient. Um, so I forgot, I just wanted to make that point too. I think that that has something to do too, with it too. I would be traveling a lot more um, for poker, like the same as the guys do, if I didn't feel bad leaving my poor helpless husband at home. So I just want to speak up. My wife is out of town at a conference and I'm doing just fine with my kids. Thank you very much. <laughs> Are you? Okay. <laughs> I've got them fed. The house is clean and they got to school. Yeah. And hey, the pizza boxes like... are in the garage. <laughs> yeah. right. You sound like you're, you're doing great. Yeah. So, but um, so I'm sorry. Okay. So repeat that question. Cause I just went. Uh, to... I was just wondering about mixed games. If you play in, what do you play? Um, I, that was, that is one of my goal. It was one of my goals, like I said, with COVID and I learned like Badoogie and do seven triple draw and stud eight, um, you know, and uh, I've played Omaha and high low for quite a while now. Um, some cash, uh, I, honestly, I like it more than tournament as far as playing mixed games. I'd rather play cash than tournament. Um, but that was one of my goals for this year and it's just May. So I have a long, you know, a long way to go for the year. Uh, but one of my goals for this year is to study and learn and be more proficient at Omaha and Omaha 8. So uh, I do I do definitely like it. I think it's challenging. Uh, lots of the ladies who live in Vegas that Kim also knows love the mixed games. And they play in tons of the events um, at the Orleans and now at one of the MGM, newer... MGM, I think. MGM is going to have a bunch too. Yeah. Yeah. And... One other um, casino there has been hosting a bunch of mixed games that the ladies go to. Can't think of the name of it, but. I mean, Hollywood, I think. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think. On it's Hollywood closed their, Sahara. Closed their poker it's Sahara. operations. Sahara. Sahara yeah, does yeah, have a nice. Sahara. A lot of mixed games. And South Point also is a place where a lot of oh. the women play the flip events are down there. Yep. Yep. And uh, yeah, it was the Sahara I was talking about that, that I see a lot of the stuff poker for breakfast people are talking about and a lot of the ladies have been playing the WPA ladies play there right that's great what um what is tra as a po traveling poker player you're as close to my own heart your favorite places that you've been and where would your bucket list places that you haven't been um I loved playing in Aruba it was awesome. We were literally at the hotel on the beach where the event center was. So, and the events didn't start till two or three in the afternoon, um, just like Malta, so that you could get up, go to the beach, take a swim, shower, you know, do everything before poker, work out right on the beach. It was really good. Um, Ireland was really nice. Really nice. Had a, had a really fun time there. Went heads up for the ladies championship, the Irish poker open and a Canadian girl got me. Um, Brigitte, which she's a very good poker player also. Um, I like playing at Pearl River where I'm heading out tomorrow. I'm gonna be playing a main event this weekend, a $600 main event. And uh, Little Kings and Queens in Georgia just, just has an awesome atmosphere and my bucket list is playground poker i have wanted to go there forever and ever and ever and i don't think i'll make it this year but next year for sure we haven't um, brought tournaments back yet so we're still oh, anxiously for sure. awaiting those so yeah for sure and i just moved to biloxi um, I'm here on the Gulf Coast, uh, just built a house on the water. I could show y'all, it's so pretty, the, the water, my, my surroundings. But um, we just moved here like six weeks ago. And they used to have amazing tournament series here. And because of COVID, they haven't this whole time. And, but I just heard they're coming back in January. So if you want to come in January, Kim. Okay, be I'll be there. <laughs> yeah. I'm putting you it should. down right now. <laughs> my house is 17 feet in the air. I'm on a house on stilts on the water on the back bay of Biloxi. 
and uh, we have a really, really great views. It's really beautiful. But uh, the poker has been very disappointing. The poker tournaments. Yeah, that's um, too bad. But I'm hoping January. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. That's a, that's a really a house on stilts. That's amazing. <laughs> Wait. Anyone uh, else have any questions for Chris? Yeah, Chris, do you plan on doing the Norwegian cruise in December? I won my way, so I do. Yeah, I, I did too. But that was back in 2019, and they yeah, they moved like, it up. Push the push to push, but yeah, it's uh, whatever it is, December first, second, whatever. December fourth, I believe. Yeah. Fourth, fourth. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I've already got it all registered and ready to go. So. Me too. Yeah. See you there. <laughs> Should be fun. Yeah. Hopefully, I'll do better Sick than brag. last time. <laughs> Hopefully, yeah. I'll do better than last time in the main. Yeah. Because yeah. uh, it was, it's a freeze out, and yeah. uh, the main. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, it's freeze out. And uh, yeah, I, I play pretty bad. So yeah. I did better in the cornhole toss on the beach than I did in the poker. <laughs> that was me. That was me also. Yes. All and right. Well, it. yeah, I was, go ahead. I was going to say, and I know you, you played and uh, Lisa was there yeah. and uh, Michelle. Yeah. I don't know and the great host that they had. I just don't know. I don't know if anybody ran deep in that main event that we know. No, I did well a few years ago in 2017. Right. And that, oh that yeah. Yeah. You did, yeah. you won it, yes. right? No, I was, we did a four way chop, ICM chop. I uh, was third, so. Yeah, yeah, you still did really well then. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. That was my best cash ever. <laughs> so. So but, yeah. you're probably going to go every year. That's dear to your heart. Yes. It is. Sick, I am booked, brag. but I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, sick brag. Um, I'm not sure with COVID still if it's easy to go on cruises. Because I know Lisa and Michelle just went on one. They had to wear masks the whole time. And uh, it's still very uh, locked down on the cruise ships. So I guess we'll see how it is in December. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, women are doing well. Women are doing really well considering what small percentage we are. Um, you know, I'm always posting, I'm always seeing people, women who are out there kicking butt. So, you know, I think we just got to keep at it and, uh, you know, have a tough skin and cry every now and then. <laughs> like I did in And Malta. encourage all our men friends to stand up for us and not put up with any crap at the tables right be nice and stand up and yeah because you know if everybody does then it'll be good wpa's got the purple tie guys now which um yeah. is, is a big movement to have the guys in the poker room stand up for us more yeah yeah for sure yeah there's yeah jim's got his purple tie oh. guy there he's got his there patch yeah, so you're lucky. You, you guys all seem like you're, you know, pretty stout. It's kind of hit or miss here. I'm in the South. It's kind of hit or miss. So I think it, these guys are from all over the place. So it's only Stuart and I that are Canadian. Oh. Uh, anyway, oh, and Harold. Sorry, Harold. Yeah, but you're out there and uh, you're out in Calgary, aren't you? Like in Alberta. Isn't that the America of Canada? <laughs> we're, we're the Florida. I think I think I think Jim's in Canada too, isn't he? Yeah, Jim is. Okay, never mind. We're all from Canada except for <laughs> a lot of Canadians on this call. Yeah. Except who? <laughs> Rob? I'm in Arizona. Yeah. Oh, Joe is Connecticut. Yeah. Okay. So. Well, that's good. Anyway, yeah. I'm going to wrap this meeting up, uh, and we're going to at least stop the recording. And I want to thank you very much for uh, giving us your time. And if anyone that watches this, because this is, goes on our YouTube channel, uh, wanted to reach out to you or find you, where would they find you? Twitter, uh, um, Facebook? So I, I have a Facebook blog and it's uh, Chris Reed, R-E-A-D, Poker Player. And uh, my Twitter is also Chris Reed, Poker Player. Okay, that's awesome. Thank you. Anyway, and well, thank you for having me. You're welcome. And we'll hopefully get you back again. And I will definitely be seeing you in Vegas. Yes, let's let's crush it. Yeah. All right, we're back. 
Um, so if you want to learn more about uh, the poker empowerment group at Rec Poker or some of the other things that we do um, in that space, uh, please check out the Wrecking Crew page or the Poker Empowerment page. Um, but I'm I'm really grateful to Kim for uh, doing this interview series, and it was great to hear from Chris Reed there. Um, so uh, for those of you in the chat right now, go ahead and get uh, your food bank uh, entries into the chat. Uh, start entering those uh, food bank entries. You will be gathering those names up uh, as we uh, close out the episode. Um, but uh, for now, John, I was going to turn it over to you and see if uh, you can tell us about the home game results. Well, of course I can tell us about the home game results. On April 3rd, we had our No Limit Hold'em Championship Series. This is a series where we keep track of points every month have one tournament a, a month and your top 10 scores count towards the player of the year points race and you earn a bronze pin if you win that player of the year points race spot conlin dan daniel kennedy won the no limit hold'em event the first one this year and l l tahoe has taken the lead in mm. the points race for that he i think uh got third place or something like that this last wow uh, month well congrats also, to both of them um particularly you know that's that's imp that's a, a name i'm not that familiar with so congratulations to that and congratulations to spot conlon daniel kennedy who uh was i think rightfully annoyed that nobody remembered that he was the gold pin the solo gold pin uh, winner in rec poker well i guess rob did remember but yes most of the panel had forgotten or at least re been remiss in recognizing the great daniel kennedy uh and his gold pin well in my defense i cannot possibly remember every win that i report on because True. you know there True. are hundreds of them although only one gold pin winner so you'd think maybe i would but Right. Um, well, I to to give you a, a break there, John, the only reason I remember is because Daniel and I were talking poker before there was a wreck poker. So oh. I've known Daniel for a long, long, long time. So when he won it, it was a significant event in my memory. Otherwise, I would have never remembered. Well, <laughs> If you if you go to Psyops's most recent episode, Keith can uh, uh, attribute the fact that that is actually something we talked about about the difficulties when there are similar patterns of memory of being able to pick one out and be able to say, oh, this is the one that it is, and so it takes certain stimuli to come in to activate that pattern in order to recall it successfully. So, John, your brain is just like everybody else's, and you're allowed to make those mistakes periodically with apologies to spot Kaufman. you know saying my brain like <laughs> ever is like yeah. everybody else's i don't think i've ever been so insulted in my life <laughs> I, feel, um, <laughs> I feel like we just got a doctor's note that sort of excused our, our behavior yeah there. so like i, I I'm, I'm taking it i'm running with it i got a stamp saying it's okay to yeah, be an idiot it, yeah yeah um but that does bring up a good point that the gold for the gold go for the gold tournament is going to be on april 17th the third Wednesday of the month. So anyone who has ever won a silver pin, however you want it, if you have a silver pin, you get to play in the gold for the gold tournament. There's only 44 people who have actually qualified for that. And tonight there could be one more, depending upon whether we get a repeat winner or a new winner for the Tournament of Champions series tonight. And your name will ring in the annals of history for forever and ever and ever. Yes. And no one will ever forget your accomplishment or know how to forget <laughs> that you were the second go for the gold winner. Yes, ever. exactly. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Then on our nightly series, April 1st, Trey 371, Thomas Pena got his first international victory or his first nightly victory, not international, sorry, nightly victory. Uh, a really mad guy, mad guy, got his second nightly victory for the year. Now you said it, Joe got his fourth international victory for the year. And Kek Geek 65 who is currently private, 
Um, even though that is Keck Geek Jr. And I think most people already know his name. Got his first international victory for the year. And then John Lancer won the LPP event. So he can contact info at rec.poker for his free month at Learn Pro Poker. All right. Well, I'm seeing we have a couple names of in the food bank raffle here. So I've pulled out my trusty box car, and I think we'll just go one through three for the RRCC and four through six for Evil Roy. That sounds good to everyone. Yep. All right. We're going to have to base it on trust because I'm not going to pull up my camera and do all this. So it is a five, which means Evil Roy Slade can be, uh, you can contact info, info at, at rec.poker. Rec to claim your prize um and i think we had one in particular but you you'll find out when you contact us so you're saying there must be some sort of prize you're just there not sure what sort it is of prize. yeah hosts often say things like that yeah, it's how they, hosting they kind of throw these things off yeah so with that uh does anyone have anything else they want to add uh to this week's episode no. All right. Well, with that, I want to thank, oh, I want to say one last thing. Uh, MSPT coming up uh, at Running Aces, uh, April 18th through 28th. Um, this is a big uh, deal. This is one of the biggest tournaments in Minnesota that you can play. Um, big prizes. People travel here. Um, it's a great event. They run it well. Um, so, uh, come on down, uh, give it a shot. And they've got, they, if you, if 1100 is too much out of your buy-in range, they have smaller events throughout the week. They've got a mystery bounty. They've got a tag team, uh, game. They've got, they've got a lot of number of different offerings plus satellites and they're doing the milestone satellites. So those are a, a great deal, uh, too. So, uh, come on down, check it out. Um, we'll see you at running aces, April 18th through 28th. Um, and with that, I want to thank, uh john joe rob keith uh all the listeners who make the the magic happen um and um running aces hotel racetrack and casino and everyone else who tuned in tonight thanks for tuning in if you're just tuning in right now we're going to go to a strategy episode in just a second <laughs>